Hi class, uh, to help with the Linda Driscoll reading, I've prepared a brief video lecture that I hope you'll find helpful. I'm just going to get started right into it. So uh, the, the, the reading that, I'm, that this lecture covers is by Linda Driscoll. Here's the title of it. It's called Understanding the Writing Context and Organizations. It's in the People's Anthology. And uh, so basically, Driscoll offers a case study of a, of a piece of marketing writing that was done for an investment company. And one key piece of writing that she looks at is this, this phrase, when you want both safety and growth for your capital, timing is everything, and the time is right, right now. So this actually looks like a fairly effective piece of writing in terms of the rhetoric that's involved, right? Uh, it combines uh, logical, emotional, and ethical appeals. It considers the values of the audience, or at least it seems to. It also uses enthymeme to let the audience fill in key information. Uh, but the trouble is that it was well, it was kind of illegal um, because investment companies can't actually promise anything about the future. They're constrained by uh, regulatory agencies. And so the lawyers for, the, for one of the regulatory agencies involved saw this line and said, hold on, you can't say that. You're promising what's going to happen in the future. So Linda, Driscoll, Linda Driscoll's article is trying to figure out what exactly happened. So really, we're talking about constraints here. Uh, here are some of the constraints that would be involved in a case like this. As we talked, as we mentioned, regulatory bodies. Uh, other things that might involve, that might constrain the writing would be staffing practices. So are these internal writers or were they hired uh, as marketing consultants? Uh, potential for legal problems. This is just the, a beginning list. But she argues that the problem that, uh, that arose, that the message was written that couldn't be published, um, basically comes because uh, existing communications models before she started doing her work fell short um, of that. And, and she looks at two kinds of communication models that don't, don't help us understand this context. Uh, those that she, she calls one kind those that attend to communications events and the other kind those that are concerned with systems. So let's look at communications events first. What are communications events? These would be things like genre, uh, the traditional rhetorical questions and the behavior of individual writers. So what happens when we try to communicate? It's interesting, actually, that these things here actually fit pretty nicely into uh, Fagley's perspectives. Genre and rhetorical questions might be considered part of the um, textual perspective, and the behavior of individual writers would clearly be the individual perspective. Um, uh, so Driscoll's trying to move this a little bit farther ahead, and she's saying you can miss important organizational context if you focus just on these things. So I think in this, in this aspect, she aligns pretty nicely with Fagley. Now what about systems? She also argues that systems approaches to organizational communication ignore context, and she says this is for two big reasons. One, they're not concerned with meaning themselves. The system doesn't care what you put into it. It, it sort of assumes that uh, the message can just be put into a little bucket and sent from one person to another. And the system also, a systems perspective also isn't concerned with transactions among individuals. So here's the Shannon Weaver model from your book. Um, you know, and as the caption says, it just doesn't attempt to deal with meaning or individual intentions. Again, the message is simply put into a bucket and sent down a signal line, sort of a, as though it were a wire, to the receiver who can just apparently take it out and have it, right? It doesn't, that's not the way meaning is made. And so this kind of model of communication doesn't help figure out problems in problems of the sort that Driscoll is interested in unraveling. So how do we add meaning to, to these kinds of systems? Well, Driscoll suggests that we should do this by attending to internal sources of meaning and external sources of meaning. Uh, so your internal sources are going to be things like corporate culture. These are values, norms, roles, even rituals within an organization. One example of this that I came across when I was working as a tech writer, um, I've probably mentioned it, I, I worked for a, a year writing instructions for Best Buy corporate in the Twin Cities, and uh, there was a cultural expectation there that everyone had a notebook. In fact, people often had sort of nice, nice notebooks, not just legal pads, but sort of nice like those moleskin notebooks or... Um, sort of a black leather-bound notebook. And during meetings, people spent all their time writing in pen, in a notebook. Um, and so they had that sort of record of things. And that's the, that's a sort of ritual, uh, cultural ritual that can actually shape an organization. It's a lot different to be capturing what happened in a notebook versus uh, in a laptop or on a computer. Um, 
Another example was they, they followed a weekly stand-up. So every week the whole team would meet and stand up to talk about what's keeping them from getting their work done. So they, they called this the weekly stand-up, and they, were, they would use that to address roadblocks. Um, and that kind of ritual actually is so powerful that it's written into different uh, management methodologies. That's actually part of agile methodology. So, um, so these kinds of internal sources of meaning can be very, very important to how uh, organizational communication happens. Um, now here's an example of external sources of meaning, and these are the ones that Driscoll was concerned with for her case. We've got the mutual fund company here, and then we've got all these different external organizations that shape meaning within the, within the, from this company to its investors. So we've got the regulatory bodies, we've got newspapers, we've got the markets themselves, which is the stock price going up or down. We've got investors, those are the people who are who are those are the people who actually might invest. So the, basically, the, those those are the customers, competitors, uh, and so on and so forth. And all of these, all of these are external sources of meaning that can shape the way a message, uh, whether or not a message is effective, whether or not you can even say what's in a message. So ultimately, uh, Linda Driscoll argues that even though the rhetorical situation is definitely important, um, we can't ignore the rhetorical situation. But she says it's it's not always enough for effective workplace communication. So how you interpret that statement depends on your own understanding of what the rhetorical situation means. Um, one of the most basic definitions of a rhetorical situation would be a sit basically a situation in which something happened that requires a rhetorical response. Uh, then that response should pay attention to the author, the audience, and the context of the message itself. Uh, but Driscoll basically argues that the broader context, the context in which the writer works, is more important than that individual rhetorical situation in many cases. And that broader context is what she calls the organi organizational situation.